Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here and welcome to our panel on data and reliability. My name is uh, Julia Constantinou and I will be chairing this session. I am a researcher at LSTS, uh, the research group on law, science, technology and society of VUB. And I'm also the managing director of uh, the Data Protection and Privacy Impacts Assessment Laboratory within uh, LSTS. Uh, so before um, moving on, uh, let me briefly introduce uh, my, my co-panelists by stating uh, briefly their current uh, role and affiliation. And uh, starting from my le uh, left side, uh, Francian Deschian, our moderator, is an assistant professor at the Center for Law and Digital Technologies of the Leiden Law School. Next to her, uh, Hard Jan de Koning is a software architect uh, lead for IBM Benelux. Uh, next to uh, Hard Jan, Carolina Laforce uh, is a postdoctoral researcher within the ESIDES project at the Center for Law and Digital Technologies in Leiden University. Uh, next to Carolina, uh, Brian Ford is a professor at Swiss Federal Institute of Technology, leading the Decentralized and Distributed Systems Research Laboratory. And last, but certainly not least, uh, Andy Yogi Poikola is a founding member of My Data Platform and is currently co-leading uh, the Finland's Artificial Intelligence Accelerator and advocating for human-centric uh, data economy at the technology industries of Finland. So I'm now uh, giving the floor to our moderator, Francian, to introduce you uh, to the topic. Good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome on this uh, last day of this in interesting conference. Um, so why do, we use in, why do we focus in this panel on reliability of digital identities? In her book, Automating Inequality by Virginia Eubanks, she gives an interesting illustration of how data and the digital identities constructed from those data play a role in decisions that affect people in their core existence. The example she uh, gives concerns how vulnerable citizens have to enter a bureaucratic eligibility process that is functionally unreliable. People may fail to complete the survey mostly through failures of usability. However, the inability uh, to complete the survey is recorded as a data point in itself. Failure to cooperate with the eligibility process. And here is where it gets really bad. This data point is then taken as a proxy to mark the people as societally unreliable and thereby to disqualify them from access to the resources they need without any substantive assessment of the actual need. I think this example shows how the notion of reliability plays a role on so many different levels in decisions that are made about people based on digital identities constructed out of data. Increasingly so, out of data from different sources. Some may be related to the domain of the decision, many may be related to the individual, some related to the process of the decision, some related to their environment, and possibly some that are only indirectly related or not related at all, coming from the hopes that big data will uncover the presumed natural laws of our society by the magic formula and is all. I think most of us agree that this is very 2013 to think that, but it's still playing a role, I think. I personally have a background in formal verification of computer systems, and people often ask me at the time, why would you have to verify a system if by programming you have told it what it should do? Well, I have to say from experience that formal verification is only a very limited and abstract form of testing systems for expected properties, and even that, very limited way of testing uh, reveals a lot of uh, unreliabilities towards the required functionality. From a panel of yesterday, I borrowed the quote from Tim Berners-Lee saying, we cannot blame technologies for the mistakes we make. I think it is a big mistake, or a big mistake we can make here, is to let ourselves be led by the force of the hypes and the hopes around all the algorithmic systems and so-called AI uh, all the issues that uh, algorithmic systems and so-called AI can deal with. One way in which this is a mistake is because the use of data-driven systems will introduce new vulnerabilities, again, on many different levels. 
The system may be badly designed, as in the example of the eligibility process. The system may malfunction for circumstantial and unpredictable reasons. Um, for example, power failures of the system. The system may be attacked, where the circumstantial weaknesses are probably exploited first. And the system may use a wrong model, which is a total separate uh, <coughs> level, um, which may be introduced by uh, data, training data of bad quality, unfitting training data to the problem, or an unreasonable proxy, so as failure to cooperate. Francien, one more minute, please. The last point also refers to fundamental questions like, when is a risk profiling system based on digital uh, identities actually reliable enough to make decisions that so deeply affect people, like the example of the eligibility for social support? Now back to the title of this panel. Does more data imply more reliability? In other words, do we fall for the thought that with big data we have N is all and thereby ultimate reliability to our knowledge? Or does more data and overuse of data analytics lead to overfocus on dealing with the outliers, with the abnormal, and thereby creating an unreliable rendering of our society and our values? We may start to treat the unpredictable as unreliable by the fact that they are unpredictable and therefore a danger to our automated society. In this respect, sometimes less may be more. And I think this is recognized, for example, in the data minimization principle. But in this panel, we are going to explore different perspectives on the reliability of data and data processing to constitute digital identities of individuals. To which extent can these... Um, to which extent um, uh, can these digital identities capture enough of societal issues to deal with them, make more, more? How can we validate if this is really the case, prevent more from being less? And how in terms of legal and technical architectures can we remain in control and decide when less is more? So we have four very interesting in this, uh, speakers in this panel who will um, mostly speak about legal and um, technical architectures to deal with this issue. And I would like to give the floor to my colleague, uh, Caroline Laforce. Thank you very much, Francine. Um, I would like to talk about reliabilities, rights, and digital risk identities within uh, Dutch government practices of prevention. So let me start with three examples. Um, the first one is false positive risk profiles on um, children in the Netherlands. Uh, there is this quote from a Dutch youth inspection agency that actually 10% uh, out of all the risk profile children are falsely identified as being uh, risky. And this, in the view of the inspection agency, is a price uh, we, with a question mark, who is we, must pay for the remaining 90. The second example is... Excuse me, it's the green button. Sorry? It's the green button you have to press. Yeah, I was, sorry, in the middle. So the false negative risk profiles on suspects and asylum seekers. There are two systems in the Netherlands, um, Progis and INS Console. There are two biometric systems to identify um, persons who seek asylum. Both of the systems are highly sensitive, and as a consequence of their high sensitivity, they end up producing 21% uh, false positives. And the third example is, I pressed the green button, by the way, non-auditable risk profiles. This is an example of a system, a big database system currently uh, running in the Netherlands and uh, steering a lot of debate and controversies and uh, there are already court cases running against the Dutch state because of that. Um, the system is called System Risk Indication and it basically provides a risk score uh, on the with respect to the, the likelihood of someone being a tax frauder or not. Um, in 2013, as an interesting um, point, there have been 119,000 uh, cases 
in which this profiling was launched. Um, according to the Federation of Trade Unions, the Dutch trade unions, all those people who they heard from and got a feedback, they felt being treated as criminals. So, based on these three examples, what I would like to point out is that the reliability of digital risk identities, in fact, directly translates into how unreliable individual citizens are seen by government authorities. And what if the deep fake goes into that digital identity? That's just a side note. <clears throat> so currently, we have, um, in my opinion, quite a powerful legal framework, the GDPR, that offers the strongest protection with respect to the reliability of data and data processing. So, to think of this earlier sentence regarding the reliability of these digital risk identities. In terms of data and data processing, so what you put in, there are quite some um, strengths of the framework. However, the GDPR is weak in offering remedies against falsely made digital uh, unreliable, uh, unreliability claims about citizens. So, a potential could be to reach out to other legal tools. And I think an underestimation uh, of the human rights framework um, is, is not a good thing, and we should exploit it more. Because um, they're offered, there are remedies already, and uh, historically seeing there are remedies against non-discrimination in there. What I would like to point out is just focusing on Article 14, basically the right uh, to non-discrimination. Uh, I have chosen three quite interesting court cases uh, that were brought ahead with respect to government, administrative government practices in a monopolistic position as they refer to the offering of education. So I can see that as a comparable line with respect to the extent to which the Dutch government offers risk profiling and tries to tackle tax fraud, identity fraud, or antisocial behavior or child abuse as their duty to protect society from these kinds of abnormal behaviors. In all of these cases, what's interesting regarding, for instance, the first one, is that uh, the differences of treatment with respect to uh, non-discrimination are outlined as uh, not only pursuing, it's not enough to only pursue a legitimate uh, interest or a legitimate goal, but you have to reach beyond. And the second case, the state has a positive obligation in protecting, in protecting their own citizens from discriminative effects. And I think this is an addition, and it goes beyond just focusing on the data and the data input and the data processing, but it focuses on the effects of any handling. Regarding the third court case, um, what I found quite powerful is that in that case, uh, the court said consent is not even a defense. So if someone consented for being registered in a certain system, the consequences of all treatments are not a defense, even not for a state. Um, there are several other options which I could highlight, but I think reaching beyond what the GDPR offers in terms of unreliable or unreasonable inferences about citizens could offer us new possibilities. And just to close my slides, why don't we think about combination of solutions beyond the, the data protection law regime and the human rights law regime. We could think of technological, policy-related, and even human-centric solutions, and combining them, we could probably end up having more control on the effects of profiling and on the effects and the remedies of uh, uh, those who are victims of false treatment. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Carolina. Does this microphone work. Um, so, um, the plea for coming up with uh, human-centric and possibly also technological uh, solutions to the problems that we've highlighted uh, is a thing that we're now going to focus on more. And we start by the presentation of uh, 
Yogi uh, Poikola, who gets the microphone to walk around. <laughs> yes, <clears throat> thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, so I cannot stand still when I speak, uh, and I think it's uh, good for, for to get a little bit of uh, action here on stage. So my name is Antti Yogi Poikola. I come from Finland, uh, from an uh, association called My Data Global. It's brand new, established non-profit uh, three months ago, uh, and it has members from 40 countries, so it's uh, not a Finnish institution, so it's, it's quite global. Um, I have uh, two kind of ideas that I wish to uh, get to you. So first of all, if you have a computer or uh, a mobile phone, I wish that you can go to mydata.org uh, slash declaration. So that's where the essence of my data um, movement is uh, written out. But that's not uh, about this panel. So uh, regarding reliability of data, uh, my thesis is that uh, having individuals in the loop regarding profiling increases the reliability of those profiles. So uh, the idea is really uh, to turn people from data subjects to active participants, uh, uh, active agents regarding their own data. And that has uh, many benefits, I promise you. So the declaration of my data uh, has three main shifts that we want to achieve in the world. The first one being uh, that we have the great GDPR. Everybody has read the 200 pages, right? Uh, so there they have, for example, uh, some of the articles mentioned earlier, but uh, particularly interesting for my data is the article 22 about data portability. So people have actually new right to get their own data. So I can get my data and do something with it. Uh, but that's now only in the legal text. So uh, we need one button. I, I want the right to be actionable. So there is somewhere uh, real systems that um, enable people to have that right. And then second shift is that we need to move from uh, protecting people only. I mean, protection is uh, important. We want to be uh, safeguarded against um, uh, people and organizations and governments uh, exploiting us uh, regarding our data. But uh, it's like nice to be protected in cozy room and without being able to do anything. Right. We want to be also able to do something with our data. So that's the uh, empowerment part. So uh, not only governments or corporations or other organizations doing stuff regarding us about uh, with, with uh, the data about us. So letting people also uh, the rights and uh, tools to use their data. And that would lead to more open ecosystems so that uh, uh, there could be smaller service providers that, that can uh, build services uh, based on personal data, uh, even if they don't have the global machinery of collecting that. That's uh, visualized in this uh, diagram. So there are some of these um, uh, big uh, data giants, uh, both from East and West, uh, that are very, very agile in using data. They uh, actually very good services, uh, functional. Data is used, da data is put into to works. Uh, they don't care too much about data protection, then we have this um, uh, European mindset that uh, people should be protected. Somebody said that uh, where US innovates uh, and uh, uh, China imitates, then European Union regulates. So uh, we need, uh, need the protection, but climbing up from that protection corner to there where people can actually decide to do something with their data. And that leads to uh, my thesis regarding the reliability. Uh, so when we started to push this philosophy onwards, uh, so to get, uh, give control of personal data for people, we very uh, quickly ended up to the corner of identity. We need to identify people, we need to identify the data sources and the data users. And right now the global identity systems are very much centralized. Uh, you can log in with Google to many places or with Twitter and Facebook 
and basically they are holding your identities. Now there are new uh, distributed ledger-based technologies that uh, enable more decentralized manner of identities. So that's key technical part. Uh, you can Google self-sovereign identity if you wish. I'm not having a lecture on that. So we started from the data corner, moved to the identity, and now we are coming to the uh, where the data is actually used. So artificial intelligence is the hot topic of today. It will not be the hot topic of two, uh, in two years. I promise you it will fade down. But uh, for now, uh, everybody is so interested in, in AI. And there, the question is that uh, if we have, for example, these personal assistants, um, they are gaining more capabilities. A couple of years ago, everybody was laughing at Siri. It was doing uh, foolish stuff, but it's getting more powerful. And we can give a, a little bit of uh, agency for, for these agents. I could say that, okay, may, my personal digital assistant can do purchases up to 50 euros. I, I can give that kind of powers in the future. Then the question is really that uh, who controls uh, what the, these assistants are. If you think of assistant, the word assistant of big boss uh, like 100 years ago sitting in the office and answering the phone. So it was really, really crucial that the assistants didn't uh, spread the, uh, the information of the big boss to uh, all the uh, other people. And that assistant was really uh, someone who you could rely the reliability part so uh, that the assistant works for you and now it's not quite sure if we can really rely uh, on all of the uh, algorithmic uh, assistants that are on the uh, markets so I think that the human centric part is there also crucial that uh, you need to be able to uh, have access and control your personal data you need to have access and control your identity so that nobody can plug it off or uh, do something with it. Like now I'm, I'm renting my identity from Google in a way. They can cancel my uh, account if I uh, harass them too much. And then uh, again having the uh, control over the digital assistants that we are using. So that's my thesis. Thank you everybody. Thank you. Okay. So our next speaker is actually going to go into the technology that was briefly mentioned, the decentralized ledger technology. Uh, he's going to talk about blockchain. I give the microphone to Brian Ford. Thank you. Yeah, um, yeah I'll take Yogi's example. Um, yeah, so I, I wanted to uh, dive a little bit into uh, some of the technology that uh, Yogi mentioned. I think the, the goal, the, uh, the goal of giving people control over their data and, and using that uh, for reliability is a hugely important and, and valuable goal. But we also need to have a realistic understanding of the technology and what the technology does and doesn't do. And so this is uh, uh, where I come in. Uh, I've been working in this space, decentralized system security privacy uh, from the computer science side for about 20 years now, long before the blockchain buzzword came around. Um, and the, the basic goal, as I see it, is to get away from our weakest link security uh, infrastructure, where one break, one leak can completely defeat the security or, pro or privacy of huge databases or uh, uh, of personal information. And the basic goal, uh, you know, one of the basic technological goals that we're working toward is to try to turn around that security game, to uh, develop systems that get more secure as they get bigger uh, uh, and um, uh, and more uh, uh, get more users. Now that's not easy, but uh, blockchain is uh, to me the exciting thing about the blockchain idea is it goes in that direction. So it, it has certain fundamental ideas that that take us in that direction of no single point of compromise or failure and be, being able to build strongest link security. This is hugely important and promising. Uh, so Bitcoin, you know, which launched it, basically did this by creating a ledger uh, uh, and a consensus algorithm for many parties to keep, uh, uh, keep that, those ledgers in sync. You keep a lot of copies of the ledgers, so it's hard to change any, uh, for anybody to change one, any one of them without detection. So that's, uh, that's good. That's the fundamental uh, property. Uh, that's what blockchains do. But let's now talk about what blockchains don't do. So let's also be realistic about it. Um, there's a lot of people and companies talking about using blockchains to secure digital identities. 
uh, and, uh, uh, and, uh, and you know, while there is a, a role blockchain can play in that, um, there's a, a lot of really important problems that blockchain does not solve. So uh, to be brief, uh, blockchains, at least today's blockchains, can't keep secrets. They're not good for managing private data. Second, they can't tell whether the data you put on them is true or false. Third, uh, they uh, usually digital identity solutions rely on putting, uh, taking uh, evidence from legacy documents and putting it on the blockchain. Again, that doesn't guarantee that the data you're putting on the blockchain is actually reliable. Uh, it just means that uh, whatever unreliable you put on it will be, will be recorded, right? And finally, uh, uh, there's biometric approaches, which are a, a completely different form of disaster for other reasons, uh, mostly unrelated to blockchain. So first, uh, l let me look at the first point. Blockchains don't solve privacy. How do blockchains work? Why do they provide no single po comp uh, point of compromise integrity protection? Well, by spreading copies of the ledger around, making, uh, uh, giving copies to a lot of people. That works for integrity, it works against privacy because more people have copy of, copies of everything you put on the blockchain. To deal with anything private, you either have to keep it off the blockchain, encrypted in fa uh, some fashion, but then the question is who holds the keys? If you keep it a, a lot of these uh, uh, identity uh, approaches, say, well, we're not gonna put the personal data on the blockchain, we're just gonna keep it on your personal devices, but then it's all lost if, you're, if you lo lose your device. Then they say, oh, then we'll, we'll you know, let you uh, put a backup copy in the cloud, but then you're back to single point of compromise, trusting that centralized party not to leak your information. So blockchain does not solve the, uh, the data privacy problem. Now, this is a problem that we can make steps toward. So my lab is working on better blockchain technology that, that you can entrust secrets to, attach policies to, and, and uh, in a way that ensures that both the privacy and integrity uh, strength scale as the system gets bigger. But I'm not, this isn't what I'm here to talk about. I'm, uh, so, uh, you know, I, I won't go into the details. Um, but there, uh, you know, that's one problem we can, we can maybe solve, but there are others that I'm not sure we can. Uh, the second is blockchains can't, don't have eyes or ears. They don't have sensors. They can't tell the reliability of the data you're putting on them. All they do is timestamp and protect the integrity of data once you put it on it. Um, and, uh, and, you know, anyone, uh, any third party, usually digital identity systems that posit that there's going to be third parties checking IDs, at least locally or remotely, um, and, you know, and attesting to, to uh, attributes of digital identities. But it's easy to get, you know, fake, fake or stolen IDs on the black market. The prices aren't actually that expensive if you look at it. Um, and so it's easy to get bad or fake data on a blockchain, on an identity blockchain, right? And the blockchain will never know. Now, of course, a lot of people, again, talk about biometrics as the solution. And there are some, you know, interesting, shall we say, uh, projects trying to use biometrics to identify uh, a, a lot of people, like refugees, you know, India is trying to deploy this in mass. Um, the, the important point here to understand is uh, using biometrics to authenticate when you're logging into your phone or a particular device that knows you, that's a completely different problem than using biometrics for digital identity. Because using, for many of the things you need biometrics for digital identity for, you need to ensure the uniqueness of the identity. You need to ensure that this uh, digital identity is, uh, corresponds to a real person and is the only digital identity that corresponds to that real, real person. You need to know that it's not one of a thousand or ten thousand botnet fake IDs by, uh, you know, by uh, um, made by a criminal or uh, or, or botmaster, right? So, uh, and to do that with biometrics, you you need not just one equality comparison between your fingerprint and and something stored on a phone. You need at registration time when anybody's signing up, uh, uh, getting their bio biometrics collected for to register a new identity you need to do an inequality comparison. You need to do potentially millions or billions of inequality comparisons between that and every single other user that has ever registered in that database to make sure that it's not a duplicate of any of those. Now, coming back to reliability, false positive, false negative rates, 1% um, false positive 
rate is seen as one more minute yeah, in the authentication space one percent false positive false negative rate is really good if you look at trying to do that in inequality tests if you if you propose using biometrics to uh, to test the uniqueness of a newly registered identity against say a billion other people in a country the magnitude of India every single person you register will have a million false positives you can't do that that will not work if you try to do that test which means the system is going to be completely unprotected from duplicate identities you just won't be able to do that test right so and in order to even pretend to be doing that test, you have to build that database. It has to be a queryable database, uh, uh, which is a huge privacy risk in itself, because that database has to be queryable by a lot of people around the world. Any single device can be compromised, and also any single compromised device can synthesize and create random fake per fingerprints to create more fake identities, right? Um, again, it, it takes only one break. So in summary, blockchain is a very important, promising, useful technology for some things, but let's not get overexcited. Blockchain is not the solution to digital identity. It can't keep stuff private, it can't tell what you put on it is true, and it most importantly can't distinguish between real and fake people. Is, uh, is this problem solvable? I think it is, potentially. I think there are ways to solve it, but the so solutions are neither blockchain nor big data. And my group is research, doing some research on that, but that's another story. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Brian. Uh, so you showed us very uh, uh, convincingly that uh, to trust the information or to rely on the information on the blockchain, we might have to rely on the old systems that we already have. It's not a trust solution as it's some, sometimes uh, praised. Um, we're now moving to our next speaker, Geert Jan de Koning from, uh, from IBM, who will talk a little bit about another buzzword of the uh, past few years, as uh, Yogi also highlighted. Um, and uh, it's at least partly about how uh, AI pushes our notion of what is considered to be reliable, um, for example, what it means to be a good performer in your job. I give the microphone to Geert Jan. Thank you, Francine. <coughs> well, good morning. Uh, glad to be here. I don't know whether it appeared to you, but uh, the moment I got in here, I feel a kind of a, 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 a two persons at the same time. So half of the time I am uh, I'm uh, the one who I thought I was this morning. <laughs> the other half of the time I'm called Wi-Fi Access. Uh, so it's a challenging day here for me. Uh, I learned already quite some things today. I'm going to take you on a brief tour to uh, the consequences of AI with regard to data privacy, data protection, and what you can do about it. So just five minutes on the internet will teach you this if you type in the right words. And so it's clear that we have a challenge. AI and data protection are a little bit in battle with each other. So uh, many established institutes uh, recognize this and they say hey we have to do something about it so if i go a step beyond that and look a bit closer to home uh, you see in the outside world about us all we're being profiled all the day um, in case of marketing client retention profiling for whatever information or uh, actions they would like us to do um, but there's also an inside world so for example in companies and I can see that for, for my own, in my own company, where I'm discussing with clients about the profits for AI and, and, and used on their clients and their business, at the same time as being part of the Data Privacy, Privacy Commission in the Works Council, I can see how our own company is dealing with this. And luckily, I have many good experience in that. Um, but if you look at the inside world, uh, you see more and more AI cap uh, uh, AI capabilities apply to automated learning guidance. Who are you? What is your proof? What do you need to learn? But also salary increases. As a manager within IBM, I'm confronted with advice about which of my employees should get the most salary range of a race. Um, <clears throat> so that's an interesting stuff. How resistant am I to these kind of advices? Uh, to my opinion, I'm the one who's closest by. At the same time, I don't want to miss out on any information. So there's a duality in that as well. 
Um, so, what can you do about it? If you look at all the information that's used in the AI systems, um, there's actually a classical approach you can take here. We know a lot about data quality, data governance. Who can act on what data, when, in what role? And the key word here, there's no good AI without information architecture. A lot of data is available, but you just need to make sure that you make a good use of it. Make sure that all proper measurements, regulations are in place for good, good usage. And um, like uh, the phrase, uh, a bad sound kills good music, uh, good data can outsmart a good algorithm. So, if you want to start with this, start with what you have. Start with the systems you know, collect your data, make sure it's, it's governed, make sure it's secure, make sure it's trusted, sourced, uh, organize it, create some insights from it, analyze it, analyze it with AI, and the last but certainly not least step is make sure that you operationalize it with a, a, a trustworthiness. We had already a, a brief discussion about the word trust in the whole AI discussion. Trust is something interhuman. Trustworthiness is something we can apply to technology and, and, and uh, the way we deal with it. So this is our approach to infuse your business with AI capabilities without losing the integrity of the data that's underneath. Um, like I said, trust or trustworthiness, I don't want to have the discussion here, but think about all these aspects. Bias, if you uh, train your systems with data that are profiled against male or female, don't be surprised that the outcome will be the same. So your data set your training data set, your test data set, need to be of a good quality. And for a data scientist, usually that's the, the biggest portion of the work. Um, also, who are the users? Can we trust the people that are building the algorithms or using the outcomes? So there's an ethical aspect to this as well. Um, think about the stakeholders. What is the purpose of what we are trying to do? And I heard a discussion this morning about uh, do we use AI to find a purpose, or do we uh, AI to serve a purpose? Uh, that's a very interesting discussion. Uh, I think within regulations, it's the first. Uh, you have, a, have to have a person to start working on data. Um, Long-term issues, think about singularity, where we combine more and more technology with the way we work, the way we think, and think about the impact on jobs. So far, I've seen no real big changes, well, the big change is that where jobs do at one side disappear, new jobs appear at the other side. It's just uh, a concern, how do we make the transition for our workforce? Um, so, if you want to work with AI, think about these questions. These are key questions to make sure that you're doing the right thing. Uh, checklists, uh, statements, um, are we able to explain what we are doing? And what if we use neural networks that usually are pretty hard to, to decipher? Uh, how can we do that? Um, think about these questions when you start on your journey of AI in, in business processes. Um, and of course, we wouldn't be a technology company if we had found a solution for most of these things. And one of them is Project OpenScale and I want to highlight these things. We are using AI to look at AI. If you want to know how a neural network is working, an AI can better do that than humans. So we are now working on a project to make sure that we can explain what we do to uh, the audience that, uh, that is affected by the outcome. And we have to eliminate black boxes so that uh, we all understand what's going on here. Um, so, to summarize, start with knowing what your data is, where it is, where it comes from, and who can touch it in what, uh, 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 what way. Um, trust your data, uh, and, and, and I would here say re reliable data. Make sure that you know what data is relevant when, has been relevant when. Make sure that you know what the dynamics of your data are, are 
Uh, make sure that your sources are trusted or reliable. Uh, mitigate bias. Think about what you want to do with it. And do I see strange things happening there? Uh, do I want to take out one of the factors that might impact the, the, the quality of the outcome, but uh, uh, could also impact the balance of what you want to look for? And last but certainly not least, do a start. Use what is there. Uh, don't let all these uh, 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 questions hold you back. Uh, make sure that you understand what's going on. Start with a small project, learn from it, fail fast and recover and do it better in the next project. Oh, wrong button, sorry. <laughs> and of course, we wouldn't be IBM if we would be not a front runner in uh, making sure we show our commit commitment, uh, commitment to this in the, in the outside world. We have a formal ethical officer that takes care of all these things internally and externally. We are uh, uh, talking with the European Commission in a think tank setting. We have uh, many initiatives uh, like the toolkit I just showed you to, uh, to make sure that you make responsible use of AI capabilities in your business process. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Geert Jan, also. Um, so, uh, in the different presentations, we've, we've heard uh, different um, perspectives on the notion of reliability at different levels of the use of digital identities. We've heard in the last presentation mostly about uh, reliability uh, at the process level in the use of the data and the development of uh, data-driven tools. We have heard about decentralized approaches towards uh, reliability on different levels, um, involving humans uh, to give them control in uh, the process of the use of their data um, and use decentralized databases to um, ensure reliability or integrity of data. Um, but we've also seen some limitations of that. And at the start, um, we've seen how the human rights framework uh, can be used uh, to evaluate uh, the use of digital identities and possibly provide um, uh, guidance for uh, providing uh, remedies. We've also heard that we should not only focus on protecting, but also on empowering, uh, which is very much um, uh, uh, I think also something that the, the my data uh, message uh, is. Um, one question that came up in the in the discussion that we had this morning, and that I would like you to uh, I would like to invite you to uh, to have a little exchange about that. Um, so, what are ways to uh, prevent wrong pro profiles? This was actually a question, Geert Jan. I think you asked. Yogi, after his presentation, maybe you can have a little interchange on that point. Yes, Yogi, uh, in, in addition to our short uh, discussion this morning, so you were saying, okay, let's give people uh, uh, the, 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 the power of their own data and make sure that they can check whether their profile that's being used in all systems is the correct profile. So the question that pops up with me right away is, okay, how can we prevent people from submitting the wrong information so that they have a bigger profile. You know, the, the Facebook stuff that people are, the whole world is having great days all of the time. But, well, I'm certainly not having a great day every day. So I see no posts about great uh, uh, bad days on, on Facebook. And, and so how do you prevent people for, uh, uh, from, uh, from uh, uh, polishing their, their profile? Basically, you're saying you don't trust the people to provide reliable data. <laughs> yeah, I think it, it goes all back to the motivations and incentives. Like, uh, what is the motivation for people to post something in, in Facebook is to look good and get, gain some social respect out of that. And if you uh, post all, all the negativity, you would not be so popular in, in this social system where we live in. Uh, so. I think these kind of profiles, whether built by government externally to you or whether they are built by you, uh, they are all representations that uh, are for some sort of purpose. Uh, like, I put this T-shirt on today on purpose. I was thinking maybe should I put a, 
uh, suit like you, or what, what should I do? Uh, I took the bold marketing perspective here. I want to uh, put in, in your uh, eyes the logo of my data. So that's my purposeful identity. And someone could think that this is fake. I did it, uh, uh, it's not appropriate to this context, and, and that should be avoided. Uh, so uh, coming back to this question, I think uh, it's whether, uh, how to, avoid people or organization of doing wrong or bad profiles. It goes back to the question is what is wrong or bad? And uh, now, uh, like from uh, what is the profiling used most uh, is, is really on the marketing purposes. And uh, there I see lots of uh, like overlap that if, uh, let's say if I want to travel to Brussels, since I knew I will be coming here, there is lots of guesswork that the internet uh, browser cookie stuff and uh, all, all others, they are trying to figure out whether I'm going to Brussels or not and where I'm staying there and I get all the advertisements. And there are a huge amount of wasted guesswork. If I can just give the signal that I'm coming there and I might be needing some sort of services. So I have the motivation to actually build profile that helps me, which could be beneficial for somebody. So it's all about the incentives. Could I respond to that or yes. follow up? So, um, anybody know the the dating website OkCupid? So a few years ago, there was a, uh, there was a really interesting experiment somebody did. Um, uh, he decided to see you know whether he could kind of hack OkCupid's recommendation algorithms to make it make him really popular, find a lot of dates, and he decided he was only going to put true information. <coughs> Sorry only true information on his profile, but then he basically used big data techniques to mine, uh, to do a lot of tests to see which combination of that true information, which to put, which to withhold, which particular combination of true information uh, would make him most popular. And, and, you know, the typical, uh, typical match rate was, uh, you know, was like 15, 20% or, you know, he was seeing before. After that, after he did that, he got a 99% hit rate, right? Just doing different selections of true information, right? Now, if companies are trying to use this, this kind of information, you know, data, combinations of data that be, people are voluntarily putting on or voluntarily with, withholding, and they're trying to use that to decide who to hire, who do we want to hire, or who's a criminal and who's not a criminal, or, you know, things that really make a difference in people's lives, and everybody is trying to optimize for uh, you know, to look like someone you do want to hire and someone who doesn't look like a criminal, then, you know, these algorithms are just more and more, uh, you know, going to be, they have to, they can't do anything other than picking up on, you know, more and more subtle, uh, likely unreliable, uh, you know, personality traits or, 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 or pieces that, you know, and, and that's, that, that's going to be just as much of a problem, if not more, than we have already. Carolina, do you want to add something? Yes, uh, I was just wondering, and did you introduce the commercial context? And I can definitely relate to that. Um, coming from the fact that the commercial context provides often also uh, systems for governmental purposes, and I just mentioned the, the three first examples um, that are about profiling and are based on uh, certain characteristics, personality traits that might be unreliable or might uh, create the impression of that this citizen needs uh, a certain intervention, whatever that intervention could in include or entail, uh, the fact that within that relationship to the government, a citizen increasingly loses control in terms of trying to look for remedies, trying to, to contest that decision that he or she is confronted with is what's troubling me. And I think that there needs to be debate about and research for and, and we should maybe figure out new tools uh, with uh, respect to, for instance, the human rights framework, but also other frameworks and, and your solution in putting more control into the hands of uh, users, those who are on the other side, purely just to empower them in, in, in being able or enable them to, to contest the decision that they are confronted with or they have an impact on their lives and choices. Any other questions here behind the table before we open the floor?
floor to the audience. Uh, one, one question to Carolina. Uh, um, um, so, so I've seen with, with some customers that, that uh, once you present the outcome of a certain an analysis, um, the political factor comes into play whether or not this is a favorable outcome. And based on that, uh, you see action or no action. What is your experience with that in, in, in the larger political scene in, on a country level or a European level? Mm -hmm. Thank you for this question. It's uh, really important, I think, to raise that, that obviously politicians for sure will look out for tools, whatever they are, legal, policy-oriented, or technological, to show results, right? And what it's not easier to demonstrate risk scores uh, and numbers and that you did what that social problem asked you to do to address it by, I don't know, diminishing uh, crime rates uh, on the basis of hotspots. We had a, a different panel yesterday on preventative profiling. And, but, the, but the fact is what I often miss out on it, to what extent are those systems based on uh, presenting results as success in themselves and versus presenting them rather in their social impact with respect to how were those people who are treated as being antisocial or criminal or have tendencies needing help simply, like social aid, how were they actually helped in their own problems instead of just representing them in risk scores. So. Thank you. Um, I would like to invite the people in the audience uh, to come forward to the back microphone and maybe one of the technical people to take my microphone uh, for interventions. Hello, I'm Tobias Morsches from uh, Dutch Schutzraum, Germany. Um, my question, you um, put the reliability in context to the purpose. And uh, my question is, is it not always uh, the topic that we have to look at the purpose and the uh, kind of analysis that is done? So if I have a very, very big data set, I get a very, very good average on people. And if I have like 10,000 people, I will get a percentage and it is very, very accurate. But the individuum becomes uh, like a statistical error. And on the other hand, uh, if I have a very, very limited and focused data set, the individuum becomes much more important and I don't get a big average on everything. Is that uh, in context to the more or less data for reliability uh, a very uh, good topic to look at the purpose and doesn't it become a problem if you have a good average and use it to judge an individuum? Yeah, I, that definitely is a problem. It's also, uh, even if you do have a big data set, but uh, but it has a you know very small number of <clears throat> bad or even maliciously created data, adversarial created uh, created data. You can get really bad outcomes even across the uh, the big learning process. Uh, so, I mean you know just as a simple example in terms of averages, you know it's well known like you know if you have a single bad record. Uh, with a person's age listed as 10,000, then the average over a pretty large number of people is going to be outrageous, is, uh, you know, going to be completely wrong, right? Uh, yeah, well, you know, that's why data scientists use, use medians instead of averages for, for <laughs> often for those kinds of things. And there are other uh, protections, but again, it gets back to the point, <coughs> you know, garbage in, garbage out, you can't. <laughs> I could comment on that. I think the purpose, that's a really important word. And uh, in, in this uh, data frenzy, it's very easy to set up some sort of systems that uh, help and make it faster or more efficient of doing something and losing sight of the purpose of that, really. Uh, so 
maybe in that sense, what, what, uh, what I, when I said that bringing individuals in the loop, uh, even if there is, let's say, automatic system of uh, giving um, your tax record or something like that, uh, that's what we have had in Finland for several years. So it's automated. You don't need to fill in the tax uh, forms anymore. It's done algorithmically. It was done already before anybody talked about AI. <laughs> yeah, so it, it gathers the information and sends it uh, as a proposal for you. And you can check it. Usually it's uh, okay for most of the people, but you have, uh, have the agency there to raise the flag if something is wrong or if something is missing. So uh, I think that's kind of uh, easy to put in, in the collaborative settings when actually government collaborates with the citizens. But uh, I think uh, what, what Carolina presented, it's quite different when there is actually, you try to uh, figure out some sort of crimes or uh, other unwanted behavior where you don't have actually the uh, you don't collaborate with the criminals, so there is no this uh, kind of, uh, let's see whether you are criminal, do you agree with that uh, setting? But most of the government settings are not those. Uh, most of the government settings are collaborative, uh, and unfortunately this uh, efficiency with data can lead to just losing the purpose also in the collaborative settings. If I could push back on that a little bit, one of the basic ideas of rule of law is that if you are accusing something, you do collaborate with the criminal. That's what uh, trial by, uh, you know, law by trial is, right? I'm not a lawyer, maybe Carolina wants to comment, but I think we need to collaborate even with the criminals, but have the right processes for doing that. Thank you very much. I just wanted to follow up on that as well. Um, but also from another perspective, since you mentioned it already, from another perspective, if you are, are accused of whatever, and you are just confronted with this decision, if you are not in a position uh, to get any oversight about how that decision was presented to you, and one of the uh, main defenses currently of the Dutch government with respect to Siri is that they just don't want to be transparent because criminals can learn from it, you know? Then, then we just close the circle before we are able to start the debate and involve the have you seen the, um, I think it was Monty Python or something like that, computer says no. <laughs> little so, little Britain, yeah. So there you, somebody comes to the bank and wants to do some sort of transaction and the lady just, uh, computer says no. So that's kind of the situation where we are ending now if we don't, we don't, uh, uh, we can take the computer system and it can be huge help but then it needs the other step where uh, if computer says no, you can actually figure out why it says no, and then start totally something yeah. based on that. Yeah, that's, that's right, and that's what we call automation bias. If, if a system tells you that it's X or Y, we tend to believe it more than somebody else saying it to us. Um, but uh, yeah, it is something we have to, have to, have to deal with and I have to learn from and I have to make sure that, uh, that we have safeguards in, in place to make sure that we do the right thing. Can I briefly see, uh, uh, do people have uh, questions, more questions to the panel? And if you have, please approach uh, the microphone. <laughs> Nobody? <laughs> Um, there is one, yes. Thank you. Is it working? Okay. Uh, I'm Ivan Seke from the Central European University. Uh, some of you mentioned the Indian example in India where there's more than one billion EIDs uh, in use. But... Uh, but there are cases when not only the computer says no, but the officials, I mean the corrupt officials in India, also say, may say no. And, um, and it shows that the whole system uh, can solve certain problems. There's, uh, uh, you know, all the, all the social problems in India, but immediately create other kinds of problems. So um, those uh, officials who well, I'm not accusing anybody, but who would like to um, 
to steal the, uh, the, the rations which should be given to the, to the poor people, they uh, reportedly used the system saying that, look, you are not eligible for, for this. The computer says no, that that's the system. It's, it's absolutely a modern system. Or you are not living, you are, you are dead in the computer, so uh, unfortunately we can't give you the, uh, the, the ration or whatever you are uh, eligible for. So uh, what's your opinion? About the, uh, about the guarantees on the human side, whether there could be a feedback to the, to the system that is used correctly or, or in a corrupt way. I can react on that. Um, it, it, it has to do with, with also with culture. Um, uh, like, like I mentioned, uh, when I get advice for, from a system about my team, I always look at it advice as, okay, interesting information and not as being the new law. But that's a cultural aspect, that's how I deal with it. I can imagine that in some other uh, countries this is not so uh, uh, self-explanatory, that uh, people are not that risk-taking to actually do that. I look at it as uh, something to make sure that I take into account everything that I should take into account, that I don't miss anything on it. But like I said, it's, it's a maturity and cultural thing whether or not you are willing and, and able to do that. And, and, and adding to that, uh, the moment people know how a system works, they will start to tweak it. Yeah, and absolutely. So, you know, this is one of the big risks that, you know, people talk about, you know, the system being, you know, secure and perfect, even though, you know, what went into it was garbage, perhaps manipul deliberately manipulated. Um, uh, you know, to uh, to uh, deny people of uh, of, of uh, you know welfare or whatever, right? Um, and and I think it's a further you know just a further illustration of the the fundamental risk of <laughs> taking a data and you know data records oriented approach to deciding say who's a real person and who's not a real person, who's eligible and who's not, you know, and so that's why from my perspective, I completely reject the idea that, you know, the fundamental digital identity problem is about collecting and managing data about people. My position is we need to find ways, physically secure ways inv involving appropriate use of digital technology, but, but ways to, uh, to handle identity without collecting data about people. We just need, uh, we need to, uh, you know, focus on the actual personhood. Are they there? Have they shown up? If they show up here at this government office and somebody in power is out to get them, do they have the freedom to go to a different government office and prove, that, prove they're a real person there? And they should be able to say, okay, I see you're a real person, you know, and you can escape you know, the bad situation you're in. But if you use a data and records oriented approach, it'll always come back to the place where the, ra the bad or maliciously inserted data is. Any other interventions from the, from the room? Um, do the panelists have uh, questions to each other? Um. Well, I, I think uh, we have lots of problems on the state, uh, table and, and we need to be a little bit more optimistic also towards the solutions and uh, <clears throat> I would ask my <laughs> colleague panelists that uh, what kind of things you propose, whether on policy, technology or on other levels, what should be done? so that we are not only saying, oh, this is so problematic, nothing works, and even the blockchain is not solving the problem, so <laughs> what should be done? Well, to be honest, uh, I think uh, uh, knowledge and education is key in this, and, and although I said to my fellow panelists, panelists here that the more I uh, learn, the less I seem to know, uh, it is still a good basis to start from, and, uh, and uh, I think that's crucial, that people uh, understand what's going on in, 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 the, in the world with regard to digital information and analytics and AI and what, how this can impact their lives and how they should prepare themselves, themselves for it and or, or make a decision on how to deal with it. Yes, I can just agree with that. Uh, 
But I think what we miss often in discussion is in these beyond the involvement of, uh, of the user or the human or, or those upon whom decisions are made, is that um, we have this either or question. So either we would like to focus on those who produce these technologies and, and to make the, as you also mentioned, to make them as secure as possible. Uh, and we don't focus too much on the entry points. Uh, how does that gate data gets into, uh, what are the basis, uh, how can we make it auditable for the outside world so that they know that we create, to some extent, a transformation in a sense that it's a democratic process. I know it's super difficult to translate it into technological terms, what democracy is, like you would not imagine, go to parliament and then ask the advice of uh, all representatives for each step what you want to put in the design, but I think regarding this whole process of building identity from data uh, and, and empowering users in the sense that they are able to reflect and able to confront decisions, I think that's, and, and we need mechanisms for them, maybe new institutions, you know, new, new kind of democratic checks and balances on that process, I think that could be a way forward. But we've been here in history before, right? So. <laughs> yeah. So I guess to kind of reiterate what I uh, said earlier to the uh, uh, answer before, you know, my my big thesis would be we need a non-data, uh, uh, a small data or no data approach to digital identity. Um, and part of, I would say that part of putting in, I fully support the idea of putting people in control of their data, but the ultimate version of that uh, which is necessary is putting people control, uh, in control over uh, who can even link different uses of their identity uh, and the, the choice to be uh, not only pseudonymous when you want to, but completely anonymous when you want to, um, uh, you know, and not to have different uses of data linked. And in saying that, you know, we need to give people those rights and uh, we need to build our dig digital ecosystem so that's uh, so that, you know, people who do have that control, we also need to understand the implications, namely that that will, probably will, and should put a lot of data-focused companies out of business in, the, you know, it, it will and should undermine, uh, you know, the business models of businesses that compete primarily on being better than the next company at, uh, at mining, uh, you know, personal details from unexpected sources. I think uh, Yogi presented his uh, positive way forward, or do you want to add something to it as a closing remark? Just maybe for, for you to follow, uh, I think it's uh, good that you brought this idea that uh, it changes paradigms in business models and some companies might be out of business, so, but that's kind of natural. IBM is, is old, old and uh, is, uh, renewing its skin so that uh, you probably can do it also in the future. But uh, the thing is that what creates this kind of paradigm change? So if, is it the policy? GDPR is a big one and it's looked uh, in all over the world. Uh, so what are the new business models so it's really hard to change like technically something if, if the like uh, big uh, solid model is that advertising is the business model yeah and of course i have to react to that <laughs> <laughs> so and, and that's why i explained we have uh, some some internal processes and and people who are actually taking care of this uh, we have a data uh, 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 regulation to ins internally uh, on how we deal with our customers data uh, so we are aware of the impact of what we do as an industry and uh, we take measures to actually make sure we do the right thing and don't cross that border where it becomes a little bit awkward and, uh, and uh, people are, are damaged or, or are put in an awkward position uh, as a result. And that's also the discussion we have with our customers. Okay, you want to do this, and again, the, the, the purpose was already, uh, was already on the table. This is the key driver. You cannot... You cannot start. Thank you. You cannot start acting on data just on the fact that you have it. If you browse the internet, go to LinkedIn, go to Facebook. You can collect a lot of data of people, of individuals. These people and individuals, 
in most cases, haven't put this data there to be analyzed and to be profiled. And that's something you have to take into account here. Okay, so um, with the uh, rather positive uh, end uh, discussion, uh, I would like to also go back to the notion of less is more and uh, give a round of applause to the speaker for ending a few minutes before the end of the slot. And uh, thank you all for attending and for your contributions.